Now that you know both sides of the fence, that you've got the lawyer side of the side of the fence, and you've got the relationship side of the fence. Yeah. Where do you see a lot of lawyers suffered in their relationships, either with themselves or with their significant others, if you were privy to that kind of information? Um well, I think it's sort of very different depending on what type of lawyer you are, right? Yeah. So it's not like a kind of monolithic thing. But I'd say lawyers in corporate law firms, definitely when I was there, I felt like it was a very dysfunctional culture. Yeah. And it's hard to go into a dysfunctional culture and dysfunctional structures every day and have that not impact on you, right? Ah, Tamara, thank you and welcome to my podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, John, and inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, great, great. So straight away, I'm just going to throw to you and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are. Okay. Um, so I own a business now called Couples Counselling Sydney, um, which is a bit of a deceptive title because I don't only work with couples, I also work with individuals. Um, but I guess um, one of my specialties is relationship counselling or coaching because I have a master's in couple and family therapy. Um, but, I mean, I think generally who I am is someone who's very motivated by personal growth um, and so I do a bit of coaching. I do bits and pieces of, of different things. Um, yeah, but I didn't start out in this field. I started out being a lawyer and it's sort of been like a very non-linear career trajectory for me um, and trying to make this work kind of support me and work for me in various ways has been a bit challenging. Um, but, yeah, and I guess all of that sounds like I define myself purely by what I do, which is important to me. But, you know, ultimately I think relationships are the most important things in my life. So, yeah, that's a bit about me. That's perfect. Thank you so much. You spoke to a lot there. I love the uh, you've spoken to where you've come from, like you were a lawyer before and you're doing couples counselling now, couples therapy now. And you've got a master's and you see relationships are a huge component to what, what, what you value in life and what helps to, helps to make you who you are. So I'd love to ask you some questions around so the transition that you went through from lawyer to in relationships or, 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 or counseling or therapy. What, was, yeah. what, what brought that about for you? Yeah, well, it's kind of interesting Um I guess when I first went to uni, um, I was one of those people who should never have studied law. I basically <laughs> said to my parents, I want to do literature, philosophy, fine arts and music. And then everyone around me was saying, what the hell are you going to do with that? And, you know, you've got the marks to do law. Why don't you do law? And I kind of agreed to because I could do arts like a humanities degree at the same time as a law degree. So basically my entire law degree was sort of me pretending I wasn't doing law and focusing on my philosophy. Subject. Wow. <laughs> and, um, you know, and at that stage of my life, I wasn't really, you know, because the question would kind of be like if, if you want to be a counsellor or something, why wouldn't you study psychology or social work? But I wasn't interested in those things at that point in my life. I had very sort of traumatic kind of childhood. And so I felt like, you know, there's, I've had enough of crazy people. Like I don't want to go anywhere near that. <laughs> there's enough of those people in my own family. <laughs> um, so that's why I didn't go down that path. But I guess... You know, because I'd had this, you know, very difficult upbringing, I kind of very soon, in order to iron out my own issues, had to go into therapy and and that sort of thing. And and 
that's how I, I guess, discovered this kind of passion for personal growth and, you know, continue to do various sorts of therapy in my personal life. And then I was like, well, because the trajectory with the law was I really didn't enjoy the law degree, but a lot of people don't. And everyone said, well, practicing law is, you know, very different to studying law. So maybe you should see if you like that. And then, so I ended up practicing law. And I remember this point where I was working in this large commercial law firm, which again was like not really me, but the, the sort of received wisdom was, you know, do a couple of years there to get your runs on the board and then you can get whatever type of job you want. And I was sort of more interested in, in social justice work. But I'm I'm in this big commercial law firm in the kind of IT, intellectual property communication section, and we're doing a deal to put a satellite up in space. And I discovered that basically it was just a contract under the Sale of Goods Act. And I was like, this is so boring. Like, we're putting a satellite up into space, which you would think would be like very sexy subject matter for a lawyer. And all it is is a sale of goods act, which makes me want to, you know, like, I'm just <laughs> so tedious. I'm like, it's never going to get better than this. It's just never going to be something that I find interesting. And um, I guess, you know, after the law firm, because at that stage of my life, I was very interested in the arts. I I tried working in arts law in the public sector, but again, it's law. And, you know, by that stage, I'd sort of realised that there's, I mean, I, in my experience of lawyers, there's a percentage of people who are there because you earn a lot of money. So by the time you break down how many hours you spend at work, it perhaps isn't that good. But um, there's also like a very small percentage of people who really like thinking about legal issues, but you have to have a very particular type of mind that I didn't have. And um, so I think by that point I was like, right, well, I have to get out of this before, um, you know, I just get stuck here and end up with some large mortgage that I can only pay off by being a commercial lawyer or something. And that's when I studied psychotherapy and really seriously kind of tried to make a transition into that sort of work, if that makes sense. Yeah, wow, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, the the stereotype of a lawyer, where your colleagues, mm. what would you see the, like, well, now that you know both sides of the fence, like you've got the lawyer side of, side of the fence and then you've got the relationship side of the fence. Yeah. Where do you see a lot of lawyers suffered in their relationships, either with themselves or with their significant others, if you were privy to that kind of information? Um, well, I think it's sort of very different depending on what type of lawyer you are, right? Yeah. So it's not like a kind of monolithic thing. But I'd say lawyers in corporate law firms, definitely when I was there, I felt like it was a very dysfunctional culture. Yeah. And it's hard to go into a dysfunctional culture and dysfunctional structures every day and have that not impact on you right so it was kind of I mean I'm sure it's like moved along now because this was decades ago and and possibly it's a lot better but there was very much the sort of attitude that you just stay there till the job's done even if that's like you know you're working till 2 a.m or something wow mm -hmm. So uh, there was a story of someone I went to uni with and, and she quit the law when she was asked to make an appointment, a 3 p.m. meeting, oh, sorry, 3 o'clock meeting appointment. And she said she realised she didn't know whether they meant 3 p.m. or 3 a.m. And at that point she went, this is just not okay. Wow. <laughs> but that was the sort of thing you could just be... And, I mean, you paid very well, but you're kind of subject to whatever's happening and you could be there, you know. I, I do remember um, my last year in the firm, like I was working till 11 o'clock at night and then trying to get there at 8 or something for a period of time. And it wasn't always like that, but um, I think 
you know, so work-life balance kind of goes out the window and sort of any attempt to, at self-care when that's happening. And I think that some people are much more robust in the face of that than others. Like some people need less sleep, generally do okay in that. And I'm not one of one of those people that can work around the clock and feel okay, right? You know, yeah, right. Sure, most politicians get you know, five out, like, you know, if you're working at that high level, you're in a really demanding job, the expectation is you just do what it takes, right, if you're prime minister or something. But, you know, those are the sort of people who probably operate on five hours sleep. So it made me really aware that there's an element of kind of succeeding in corporate or government and stuff that is actually not about intelligence or capability. It's about like, you know, how you can cope under those conditions, but then is it really even kind of um, desirable to do that right? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, please. No, no, okay, I really hear that. Like there's a something that something takes over them or something that's there in, built into them that they push beyond what their body's potentially telling them, hey, no, we need to, we need to stop and and they're going to bed at 3 a.m. or having a meeting at 3 a.m. when I could be sleeping is 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 not exactly healthy. Yeah. And, I mean, I felt it was, as a woman, just an incredibly sort of demeaning culture like we had, and I appreciate this doesn't happen everywhere, but in my kind of cohort of people that were employed, um, you know, and they weeded us down from, like, 500, 600 people to 15 or something that they employed. So you were supposed to consider that this was a real privilege, right? Wow. And, um, yeah, basically the men graded all the women out of 10 and and I wasn't high up on that, right? So, like, it was quite traumatic going through all of that stuff. And, again, I'm not sure that that would be the case in every firm or the case now you know mm. after me too and a lot of things but that's not a comfortable thing to have in your workplace yeah totally and and like i, I mean you and i've done some pretty serious like shadow work and lower self work together and I, I, i'm curious around like because you can try and attempt to change a culture and like put like a, a white picket fence over it and put a mask over it but deep down you know those feelings can still exist where it is that like a misogynistic type environment or like there's this uh, denigration of um, women in general um, that you can try and paint over with human resources and all these policies, but deep down like the, these men just look down upon women. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I really got that sense. And so there's a sort of question for me around like why would you stay in that, right? Yeah. And and to stay in that, what do you have to do to yourself psychologically to be able to be there and tolerate it, right? Yeah, wow. Mm. Yeah, so what, what advice could you potentially give someone that's in that place of like questioning, what am I, what am I doing this for? What's the why did I start this in the first place? Or can I can I submit my body to this, this environment for mm -hmm. X amount of years? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, part of it is actually going through that exploration or interrogation process of why did I do this right? Because I think that what happens is that people are often on some sort of autopilot um, doing what's societally expected of them um, or what might be expected in their family. And then sometimes I think, um, you know, if you're getting paid a lot and there's not sort of you're not going to earn the same in another industry or whatever, you can end up quite stuck because you've got a mortgage and kids and a lifestyle that, you know, might require you to continue earning that, right? So I do think, like, it's really worth trying to get to the bottom of what is motivating you to be there? Because as I said, there, there are some people who really like thinking about legal problems and that's 
something that they enjoy you know I'm not one of them but I know people like that and so if you're in there because you've got a passion for that that's one thing right um and then maybe you learn ways of kind of stopping some of the other dynamics getting to you right um and I guess like not only would you have to have the sort of interest in law but also the sort of resilience to deal with the robustness to deal with that um but yeah I think that there are a lot of other people who just ended up there and don't necessarily fully know why and don't necessarily know how to get out of it right thank you Uh, I, I hear that and when you were speaking then I, I felt urged to go to well, in relationships too. Like some people can end up in relationships. They don't know how they got there, but then they're here and they've got all this other leverage of like kids and mortgage and other things. And so in your experience of what you've been going through with, with, with your coaching and your couples and um, yeah, how do you see the same thing playing out there? Yeah, well, it's interesting because I I was having a conversation with a couple the other day and they were sort of saying, you know, we're having a few issues, but we're sort of, we've got to this point in our life where everyone our age is getting married and having children and, you know, so like I think again that whole peer or parental pressure sometimes can maybe make people go down a route that doesn't feel that true to them on some level like I have heard people actually say you know I said to them you know how did you decide to have a child and and they're like well everyone else is having children at that point right um so yeah I, I just think that tide that tide of cultural societal parental expectations can be very strong for people yeah right 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 yeah I hear that the, the pressure to conform into something and if you're not conforming them what are you doing yeah and being able to make your own choice well why do i want a child like why do i why yeah. do i want to get married why do i need to be with this person for the rest of my life like yeah I, I know, like in my own family dynamic but for me like being raised in a, in a very religious household assuming that the, the one person that i choose from the from the beginning in my my 20s is the person i need to be with for the rest of my life and so, oh wow! Like this, it, it was mind blowing to me when I realized that that first relationship was coming to a close. Mm. And it confront all of my religious programming around. Oh wait, I'm I'm actually allowed to have more than one relationship. Am I? Is that okay? Is that okay? Am I going to go to hell? You know? <laughs> I laugh, but it can be really painful for totally, people. Totally, totally. I think it's important to be able to laugh. Like at yeah. some point, you go. Ah, oh, life. What a, what a hilarious series of events. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think once you start off the, the social, the socially prescribed path, it comes with a sort of anxiety of choice, you know, as the yeah. existential philosophers would say, because <laughs> I'm a philosophy student. <laughs> and, that, um, and that's hard, right? Because there isn't a you know, prescribed route that's there for you and you have to make your own decisions and then, you know, and that weight of responsibility and um, choice can be difficult, right? Totally, very much. And the choice of you starting your own business, what's what's that been like for you? Challenging. I mean, I think I've done everything in my life to avoid starting my own business. <laughs> Because I'm not, it's kind of one of those things where you've tried absolutely everything else to make it work and it just didn't work. And then you're like, right, well, this is obviously what I have to do. So, um, you know, I superstitiously think the universe was pushing me in that direction. But my kind of original um you know, trajectory was after I finished studying counselling psychotherapy, I went to work at Relationships Australia and, um, yes, it basically (laughs) went from a corporate lawyer's salary to a community sector counsellor's salary, which at that point was like 
absolutely untenable. Everyone else in the organization had a partner who was earning a lot more than them. And that's how they um, managed to work there or was somehow independently wealthy. Yeah, 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 right, right. It was right. just not, it, it's, it was beyond the sort of, you know, like sometimes you can say, okay, some occupations earn less than others, but this was not a living wage, right? And the first few years I was there, I had a partner who was a lawyer, not that, you know, I wasn't really living off his salary, but at least it was kind of a backup. Um, and then we split up and, um, yeah, and I was kind of realising I had made some very low-income decisions because I inherited some money from my grandmother and I kind of thought, well, you know, I don't have to worry about this as much as some other people because I've got this backup. But it sort of became apparent to me after a while that, um, you know, even with that money, this is not a tenable situation, yeah, right? Right. Um, and then I was kind of faced because, I mean, I think this is probably something that's impacted you as well, but I know that in um, Australia, counsellors and psychotherapists are at a kind of in a really disadvantaged situation compared to psychologists. Um and so I don't know if the people listening will know the ins and outs of that, but basically, you know, psychologist is someone who goes to uni, does the four years of um, undergrad rats and stats, then does the, you know, master's or doctorate mostly in CBT or in um, acceptance and commitment therapy. And then as a result, they can get um, referrals from GPs um, they can work in the public sector environment. So, you know, jobs in hospitals or community health or whatever. And social workers, although they do a different sort of training, they can um, actually, you know, they have most of the same benefits. Um, and the government in its sort of amazing foresight in this area. <laughs> Yeah. allows people to train as counsellors or psychotherapists, but then it doesn't give them any of those benefits, right? So you're not really recognised as an occupation that can work in the public sector. You're not, you can basically only work for yourself or in the community sector. And I tried the community sector and that was untenable, although they have had a few fair pay cases since then, so it's better now. Um and so then I was kind of faced with, do I go back and do like a psych degree or something to make this work for me? Mm. Or what do I do at this point? And I think um, my issue was I had done about six years training in psychotherapy. It just wasn't the sort of training that was recognised. And I didn't actually want to do psychology training because I had made a conscious decision that I didn't really like the frameworks that we used. Right. Um, I sort of have, in the last few years, come a bit around to CBT, but I didn't necessarily feel that any of that training would give you the skills to sit in a room with someone, you know, and relate to them. Mm. Um and so I think like at the end of my uh, community counseling sort of experience I was just really burnt out because the other thing was I was working you know in Western Sydney with people with really complex needs often um, not very well off financially I was doing domestic violence and child protection stuff every day wow um and I felt like it's interesting because that sort of crisis sort of frontline work really lights some people up and that's where they're supposed to be. But for me, it was not, I don't think, where my skills, are, like I think my skills are really kind of giving people more insight and stuff sometimes into complicated things, right? And you don't use any of that. in the, It's like crisis management. It's, um, and so by the end of, my time working in all of that I just felt so depleted by the whole thing I was like I can either go 
study psych or go back and do something that uses my law degree where I could actually <laughs> earn a lot more money. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I went back into policy work for seven years and I only just sort of came out of that in the last couple of years. Yeah, this is a very circular way of answering your question. But perfect. It's perfect. This is great. Yeah. Hmm. So with the policy side of things, now that you've touched on it, yeah. what excited you about policy? Well, I think that um, I was in some ways trying to kind of draw on both my legal and kind of mental health sort of skill sets. Mm. So I was doing, you know, I worked for a year at New South Wales Health and I worked for a year and a half at Domestic Violence New South Wales um, I worked at the Child Abuse Royal Commission for a couple of years. So it was all, you know, a lot of it was around policy about abuse and neglect. And um, so it sort of felt like I was drawing on both these things without like having to retrain as a psychologist or something. Um, but I think um, I can't say I ever had a passion for it. It was more a compromised type of thing. It's like, Given that this this therapy stuff hasn't worked very well for me in terms of earning a living, what can I do with the skill sets that I have, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, and I mean, I learn a lot of really interesting things from it. Um, but I think I'm actually quite a purist person. I'm not very good at being a pragmatist and I think that um you kind of have to be a bit of a pragmatist to work in government or NGO structures because you're really being driven by what's funded and what's permissible in those structures and there are very big restrictions to that right yeah totally so what would you in creating policy where did you see the the biggest gaping holes of like how can how how can anybody see that this is going to work or not work or yeah well i mean i think um the royal commission experience was interesting in terms of gaping holes because um when i started working there i think the idea people had in t- of child sexual abuse was that it's like an adult abusing a child often a member of the clergy unfortunately that's a stereotype of it which is not without foundation when we look at that um but when they actually looked at people reporting child abuse to the commission because people came forward in all the states across australia with stories of what had happened to them turned out that one in every three cases was like a child abusing another child often an older child so that was like um and I worked on the policy volume that the Royal Commission produced on you know how to deal with that issue of children sexually abusing other children um which they call harmful sexual behaviors or problematic sexual behaviors and very specific terminology around it to sort of not stigmatized children um but yeah so that was interesting in terms of New South Wales did have the most developed response to that sort of both in therapeutic and policy terms but there were a lot of states across Australia where not much was going on and a lot more needed to be going on right um and so you know recommendations were made about what could they do in that space to help um, and what sort of therapeutic responses did children need? And the government, the New South Wales government did actually take that up as a policy priority and start rolling some of that stuff out. So that was quite gratifying. But um, that was kind of, that's a bit of an anomalous position in policy land, I find, because the Royal Commission is sort of a very... Um, specific creature where you are sort of operating outside of the parameters of normal government and people do take up the recommendations um whereas you know I spent two years at Homelessness New South Wales and every submission I ever wrote was we need more social housing and we need more crisis 
case management supports and nothing ever happened about that, you know, for the two yeah. years. And then at the end of the time, I'm less like, I cannot write another, like, it just feels like a useless waste of time. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I hear the in that corporate structure, whatever that that pre-government, the government structure, the lower structure, when you see something that's wrong and you make a submission and you know that need, it needs to be done, it needs to be tended to, and you keep on sending it and there's futility. Why No one's doing anything. I can't see any progress. No one's escalated. No one's get, did anyone get back to you or was it just like a black hole of? It was often a black hole. So this was like I was working in a, a non-government organisation, so not government. It's non-government, NGO. But, like, we're lobbying government to do what needs to be done, right? And there, there was no political will to do anything about it, even though, you know, like lots of evidence worldwide showed that this would be better for them. Totally. Even And they were a conservative government, but, like, even on an economic analysis, it would be better for them because they'd have to spend less in terms of dealing with all the people who were homeless all the time, right? Totally, totally. Yeah. And the low and effect of having like kids and, and families that are homed. Yes. Like the the long the longevity of that that is is yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just like, you know, you write these things, no one ever does anything about it. Um and then you get kind of invited by government to participate in things that are a bit of a farce. Like they're not increasing the pie or the budget for housing, which is what desperately needs to happen. They're just kind of deciding that youth this year will be a priority cohort. So we'll focus on them and on the rest, right? But it's not making any difference. And then at some, at some point we're all thinking, well, what is, you know, what is the point what of all point? this? Yeah. yeah like, I really believe in the um, the cause, but yeah, this is not really very helpful. And, and what would you say is missing there? Because, like, people who are at the cold face or who are looking at what is being thrown at um, institutions that need to sort these problems out, like crisis management, like what's missing? What's the missing link here between? hearing the information, taking it in, acknowledging that this is an issue that needs to be dealt with and actioning it? I don't um, really know. You probably need to ask someone who's sort of much more well-versed in kind of political science than me, but I just really do feel on some level that, you know, government is kind of broken Mm. and... Um, you know, I know that there's a lot of work around neoliberalism and the kind of paradigms we have now. Um, but yeah, it really does seem to be the case that, you know, even like when you're within the public service, the government, there used to be this culture that, you know, public servants give frank and fearless advice, as they say, right? So, um, you know, they look at the evidence, they tell you what needed to be done and government will kind of take that into account. And I feel like nowadays it's more, um, you know, you toe the line, you can't really give frank and fearless advice. No one's expecting you to do that. It's kind of career limiting if you do. Career um, limiting. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, I feel like to work, it, it's just for me on a personal level, I'm very much an outcomes focused person, which is I think why I like counseling to some degree, because you work with people, you can see a positive change, right? And for some people, they're less outcomes focused, they're more kind of process focused. So it's kind of like, I like thinking about the policy issues. And then ultimately, whether they do something about it or not, I don't really mind so much because I've enjoyed that sort of intellectual exercise but I do think in order to kind of psychologically survive some of the structures of corporates or government or whatever you kind of need to sever yourself from (laughs) any hope of an outcome being achieved sometimes right and and how would the philosopher in you frame that (laughs) I don't know. What it makes me think of is, I don't know if you ever saw that um, TV series Severance. I haven't, no. Tell me. Okay, so it's kind of like a sci-fi series. It's on Apple TV. 
And it's all about this world in which they've kind of severed people's brains. So you can't remember what goes on during work hours. Like there's kind of a separate you at work. Wow. And so you've got no really no real recollection of what happens there. And and I kind of feel like that's what contemporary society asks of us in a lot of ways. Like just be the cog in the wheel. Don't care about the outcomes. Don't care about what you're contributing socially. All you can hope for is to earn enough to support you and your family, right? Um, and to some degree, like if people have families and kids, it is, you know, maybe that's their locus of meaning, their side of meaning that I'm earning enough to provide for my family and my family is the most important thing for me and so I don't care so much about my work or the outcomes of my work but like there's something very insidious and toxic about that. Totally. Yeah, I agree. Um, like I, I see the, the concept of just doing my job. I'm not really paying attention to, wait, where are we actually going? Yeah. Like, do, you, do you want to encourage your kids to follow in the same footsteps? Because you can see how it plays it in the mental health. Yeah. Where it's like, cool, you're splitting yourself. Who are you really at the core? Like you, the, the, who you were as a child and what your hopes and dreams were, whether or not they were nurtured or not, they'll play out as, as mm -hmm. an adult. So do you want to fix that stuff now or yeah. when? Or Yeah. When? Yeah. And it, it's so interesting because there's both psychological and kind of social components to it. Like who do you have to be psychologically and what do you have to kind of sever from yourself in order to exist in that? But also like if we become blind to the outcomes of what we're doing, that's when we get things like environmental destruction and global warming and like a completely unsustainable environment because everyone's just not looking at what the output of anything is and not connected to that. And really we're sort of continuous with the world around us. So if that's unhealthy, we're going to be unhealthy. Like you can't sort of live in that environment and just blinker it all off, right? Totally. Oh, well, yeah, you can attempt to. But it's, you can it's, attempt to, but it has serious annoying. costs. It has, yeah. Yeah, serious costs. You totally have serious costs. So like, what, what's that part of the human condition? Because I see that that's been, that's, that's like built in from a very, that's old. So what, like, what, what is that? I don't really know. I mean, it's always, it's kind of interesting to me because you know that we're talking about like people who don't um, don't examine what they're doing and don't think about why they're doing it right. And um, I think I'm kind of anomalous in that way in that I have always thought a lot about, you know, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, what the impact of what I'm doing is. So it is kind of I don't fully get like being in that it's it's very hard for me to kind of think about how would that be like who would I have to be to conduct my life like that right because if anything I think I'm too far the other way mm. yeah thank you when you were speaking that it reminded me when I was in corporate mm. and I would be quite happily I started there. I felt I felt like I had morals and values when I started. Yeah. We and all do. <laughs> There's a gradual attrition. <laughs> totally gradually. It was siege, <laughs> under siege. Like I see that that the, an offer of a, a higher pay, a higher pay, or some kind of accolade, and I'm like, I don't need that value anymore. What is it, what is it giving me really? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> righteousness is giving me right now but i could really see that attrition over time and then when i was in there for like 17 plus years i could really feel by the end of it what am i doing and a partner questioned me and said john how could how can i respect you if you're in a job that you don't like like deep yeah. down when you when you're interrogated by it it's like i actually don't like working where i'm working <laughs> how could you do that it's like, yeah you're right i'm just, i don't know why have i been doing this for so many years but the same stuff like yeah the mortgage payment, the yeah. accolades, you know, the travel, the business travel, all that, yeah. the, 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 all that stuff. Like it really massages you in a way 
I think like never, never land, like it massages you in a way where you never need to grow up and face yeah. that, 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 that reality of what, why am I doing this for? Why am I here? Yeah. What's the outcome of this? Is there going to be enough for a future generation? How do yeah. I want my kids and the, and the people that I speak to as kids um, be, be nurtured and loved in, on, on a planet that is, has got tr- attempting to have blinkers on? They see something that's, that knows is going to be devastated in the long run and it's yeah. trying to stop from it, you know? Yeah. But, I mean, I have endless compassion for that because it's hard, you know. It's hard. We, we don't live in a healthy society emotionally or socially in a lot of ways and people are just doing their best to kind of exist within it right and maybe not choosing the best way but you can totally understand how they get there right totally 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 understand and i think that's i think as people that help people understand themselves and move through their relationship issues that validation piece of like yeah hey yeah i hear that you know, and the validation allows that, oh, I'm, I feel human. Like you're making me feel human again. Yeah. And, and how that plays out in their relationships moving forward. So what's been your experience of that? Would you say, oh, of validation? Of validation? Oh, I mean, I think it's the most important thing, right? So mostly the model I use in couple therapy is something called emotionally focused therapy and it's very kind of empathetic supportive non-pathologizing all of those things so there's a lot of validation in it yeah and I don't think you really get anywhere without that right people are not going to be really all that responsive to you coming in and saying this, that, and this is kind of wrong with the way you're conducting your life. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, right, not coming back to you, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being my mum and or my dad or somebody yeah. of my life that's like insulted me. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think, you know, when you were talking about that corporate stuff, like I actually think it's quite helpful for both of us that we've been in that environment, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And that we understand how that might work and how people might end up there. Because I think a lot of mental health professionals might go straight from learning, you know, doing their degree to working in that field. And they haven't had the experience of, you know, what it's like to work as some sort of other professional and what sort of pressures you might have. And I was thinking as well, you know, in terms of what keeps you there, that there is this, you know, when you were talking about the ego massage, right, like it is often a lack of self-worth, right? You don't have that intrinsic feeling of feeling worthy that like if you had better attuned parents, you know, the perfect situation you would have. And so you can get very hung up on receiving certain types of accolades from the world that are slightly off, you Mm. know. Mm-hmm. like they're a form of ego massage but they're perhaps not what you should really be seeking or ultimately not gratifying in the long term totally totally agree um i remember going through a multiple restructures at this in the corporate structure that the the place i used to work at and i would be sent in to analyze people to see well do they need to be here and i would, and i for me personally like I knew that there was this, this value piece in me. I was like, John, you need to tell this person that they could be made redundant. Like in a month's time, this conversation is not about, I care about you. It's about, cool, is what you're doing, can I make a piece of software do what you do? Or can I offload what you're doing to somebody else in the business who has low capacity? And for me, there was a, a real battle between, like, I know this person, like, I know their kids, like, I've had conversations with them about around the the water cooler or the coffee machine, I know their life. But here I am, putting this mask on, based on my position description, to be something that I'm not, in order to get an award on the other side, which would be, yeah, John, the way you handled that analysis and the restructure, what you recommended for that restructure was great, you know, getting all the pats on the back. But deep down, like, what am I, what am I doing, you know? Like, can I, can I, I'm not, I wasn't allowed to tell them there's a pending restructure because that word gets out. And then everyone in the business is like, when's the restructure happening? And it's just like all that kind of stuff. 
Yeah. And it's awful. And like what sort of toll does it take on you, you know, to be stuck in that position, having to enact that type of stuff when it doesn't feel okay on some level, right? Yeah, it doesn't feel okay. And then and then burying burying the grief effectively. Yeah. Becoming like masterful at being two faced. Yeah. And then and then wondering why people don't like me as a person. <laughs> <laughs> I really do wonder. <laughs> why? Why, do, why, why? Why what's wrong with John? I don't know. He's just two faced. All right, fair enough. <laughs> but I mean, I do also think uh, I feel like maybe I've Raised this point with you before once, and that you know, when we sometimes comment on each other's posts or whatever, but in personal development guru land, like everyone seems to think you should have your own business and be an entrepreneur, and, and anything else is not being true to yourself and stuff. And I think you know, there's something really not okay about that either. Because look, we need hospitals, schools, um, oh. industry, like society wouldn't operate if people weren't willing to work in organizations and so it's sort of a question of how can you sort of resource yourself if if it's true for you to be there right um how can you resource yourself to be in that environment in a healthier way how can you help to build healthier organizational environments all of that Totally, totally. I, I love that you spoke to that because, like, nurses in particular, like nurses super under resourced, teachers super under resourced, even in in the trades industry. So, like, carpenters and plumbers, they're, they're, they're that whole subset of that community hugely into like um, drugs, like like um, often ice and cocaine and, and alcohol, and um, in the mining industry as well, they have a huge huge income, but they haven't got the the tools to be present to what's really going on for them so that again more drugs alcohol or buying houses buying things so moving from addiction to replacing one addiction with another addiction and in all of that i see there's this human condition of what is it that you really want and can you speak to your wants and needs and or can you form your own conglomerates to 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 make hospitals that are that are well resourced or schools that are are more resourced more um more caring towards teachers so teachers aren't thrust with this responsibility of now you now you're raising my kids but there's more there's more space for the the human component of 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 the well-being yeah that's right so the big question is you know how we create that but you know I think because if I, I think about my work I feel like generally it's all been about well-being on either a personal or a social level like the policy works about the social level but um I do think you know as kind of therapeutic practitioners we have a real role to play in you know if if people kind of personally have more well-being then they can change the social structures so there's more well-being in in those but if people are ultimately very cut off from their wants and needs and any form of like caring for themselves in a healthy way as opposed to an addictive way that's sort of numbing the fact that they're operating in an environment or in relationships that aren't working for them um you know once people get more healthy they can they can change the societal stuff more yeah totally agree totally agree and in your journey with your business yeah like so what how many years have you been running in your own business so it's only from this year like um because I left the policy space at the beginning of 2022 god I've lost track of what year we're in this is not (laughs) I'm old now (laughs) I have excuses (laughs) um but yeah so I worked in someone else's practice for a year um I felt it was kind of helpful in terms of because I'd been out of the field for quite a few years, wanted to sort of regroup. Um, and but I was kind of forced to start my own business. This is my reluctance about the whole thing. But like, you know, I've tried every other kind of, I've tried the community sector, I tried working for someone else. He was unfortunately not a very ethical person, right? So I think there's kind of a um 
a split. Like if someone else is running the practice, they often take some of the fees you earn from each session, right? But there's kind of an industry standard of how much it's okay to take, right? Right. I was like gouging the majority (laughs) of (laughs) an MLM. MLM scheme for therapy, you're nice. That's right. <laughs> so he's got, you know, five people working for him now. He's earning incredible amounts of money. And I'm just like, you know what? I am not, I have, it's ultimately about self-worth in a way, you know, like I have been underpaid for so long in these sorts of occupations. And I'm like, when am I going to get to the point where I feel like I can earn what I'm worth? Then I, you know, it was sort of at the point of, I am not prepared to do this anymore for the type of wages I've been receiving. Right. I make this work or I exit the field, but like I am not tolerating this anymore. (laughs) It's like when you get to the end of a bad relationship and you're just like, (laughs) there is not one more moment. my body can be stuck in this situation <laughs> yeah, I'm out I'm done no more conversations can't make me stay we, 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 we're done here you know yeah, yeah. So for you what would what help would you need from communities for people to come to you like what what people would you love to work with like what yeah. yeah um uh look you know like any therapist I like to work with motivated people <laughs> yeah totally um you know because I think it's quite interesting. I once did a coaching course where they were saying your ideal coaching client is you a few years back, right? You're helping them to negotiate the things that you've dealt with. And I think, you know, my situation is I'm an intelligent, motivated person who likes to grow and I like working with those people, right? Um, but, you know, I, I just like couple therapy. So I'm particularly, you know, I'm happy to work with anyone who wants to come in and do a couple of work. And, you know, um, you can't just be a therapist for the easiest clients, right? Totally. Often, often the people who are less easy, it's because they've got deeper wounding and you need to be compassionate to that. And, mm. yeah, sometimes those people that come in and are quite resistant and defensive and everything at first turn out to be the people that grow the most in the end. And that's like the most beautiful thing when that happens. Yeah, I love when, you, when you're doubling back to what you said before about the outcomes, like being able to see that person's growth. Yeah, that lights me up too. Yeah, like being able to see someone that's come to me from a some kind of family dynamic that was was upsetting and traumatic, or had the kids in tow as well, and they just sort out sort out something for their children, and knowing that they've they've come out the other side fully empowered. Like, oh wow, I can I can do this. I can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, it just yeah. really lights me up. Yeah. So how, how can people get in contact with you? What's, what's how, how um, can they reach out to you? Yeah. Okay. So I've got a, a um, website called Couples Counseling Sydney. Um, it's at www.couplecounselingsydney.com.au. Great. And I'll give you some steak knives as well. <laughs> The website's actually Couple Counseling Sydney rather than Couples Counseling because I couldn't get the same domain name. Um, all my contact details are on there. And mm. yeah, I'm happy to work with any. I'm happy to do individual coaching, individual relationship counseling, couples counseling. And I'm sort of branching out a little bit into um, trauma work. Now I'm doing, um, I find trauma work really interesting. The field's moved on quite a lot from when I first did it. So I've just been madly um learning some extra stuff and now i feel like i'm kind of ready to go back into that very exciting so the philosopher part the philosopher part of you what what vision would you like to see for the world like what would what would be your ideal goal for the for the world in the future oh my god well i feel like i'm not too much of a microscopic you know part of the world to really have a, a grandiose vision for how it should turn out but you know I, I think I think I probably have the same vision as you John in terms of like people being more psychologically healthy and or emotionally healthy and that leading to kind of more emotionally healthy communities yeah 
and that we have something of value to leave the next generations, which at the moment is, you know, it's pretty dire to think about that. Yeah, it really is. And I think that that hopelessness piece and that despair can keep people in like situations that they don't feel like they can get out of. Yeah. Like pe- people like us that can validate that hope and despair and then go, oh, you know what? You, you can create something else. I know it's hard and you'd be pushing against the tide and um, with the right community and support and that reinforcement, you can you can move mountains. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And it's about, you know, letting people know how they get that support and supporting them, you know, to get to that better place. Totally. And then to have that, you know, that spark of life that you get from being in a better place and be able to communicate that to other people. And it has ripple effects, I think. I think it does. I think, I think, and you've seen, I think you've seen those ripple effects happen too. Yeah. 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 